A new industry study shows how common large capacity magazines are. Plus, DC settles its case against the NRA. All this and more on the news update. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the news update. I'm contributing writer Jake Fogelman, joined as always by Reload founder Stephen Gutowski, uh, founder of TheReload.com, where you can head on over and sign up for a free uh, newsletter to get everything that's going on in guns uh, every week. And speaking of that newsletter, we're going to head on over and see what we've got for stories. Um, Free starting weekly with, newsletter here at the, the Reload. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, starting with a story from Maine Public, uh, the Maine legislature just ended this week, and everyone was kind of watching to see if uh, new gun legislation was potentially going to pass in the aftermath of last October's Lewiston mass shootings. And it looks like some gun bills did actually make it to the finish line, uh, but nothing too sweeping. Uh, wasn't the, the the most controversial bills, but they did end up passing a 72-hour waiting period for all gun sales. Mm. A sort of half measure universal background checks, I guess you could say. It only applies to advertised private sales. And then yeah, they banned bump stocks at the state level. So not quite the big red flag law overhaul or assault weapon ban that some people asked for, but still some changes. Yeah. I mean, waiting period's fairly significant, right? Um, most states don't have that. Although, some, you know, that's that's one of those policies where you do occasionally see them as like holdovers in, in red states, like Florida is another example of uh, right. so the law that that uh, deep red state like Florida, well, trending deep red, right, at this point, used to be more of a purple state back when they passed these. In fact, I think when this, this stuff was passed, they used to be more of a, a blue state. But uh, yeah, they still see those out there in a couple of places that you might not expect them, given the polarized nature of our gun politics today. But yeah, uh, waiting period is fairly significant, 72 hours. There's no exception for people with concealed carry permits, for instance. Um, there is an exception for law enforcement, as there always is for every right. gun control law. Um, but uh, an exception as well for corrections officers, firearms dealers, licensed dealers, and um, uh, security personnel, too. Like if you have a security license, uh, security guard license. But, um, yeah, the background check one is kind of a incremental version of universal background checks. I don't know if you advertise it for sale, but, and actually in Maine, that's, you know, I think the discussion about universal background checks is takes place with people who, uh, either live in more populated areas where there are a lot of gun stores you could go to and easily transfer if you make a sale, but Maine is not like that right i mean maine is a very rural state and it's actually a fairly significant burden to have to for some people in maine i imagine to have to go to their local gun dealer to transfer a gun anytime they want to sell something um of course i guess in this case it's only if you're av actively advertising a gun for sale um yeah they mentioned we'll see. printer printer online, which is just funny specifications. You're taking out an ad in the paper or something. Then you have to go do a background check. It's yeah. interesting. It, it's strange. Um, and we'll see if anything comes of it, to be frank. like This is another common critique of universal background checks generally is that they're essentially unenforceable uh, if you don't know who has the guns or uh, which is why people argue they would necessitate a registry to be enforced. But, um, and part of the, that's one of the main reasons you see a lot of gun rights, uh, activists opposed to universal background checks, even though they poll fairly well. Although I guess Maine again is an example where, um, while they poll this policy, universal background checks polls very well, uh, when put to a vote in Maine in 2016, it, it didn't pass. So um, and that might be another reason why they didn't go full back universal background checks and they're just doing this sort of advertised used gun sales thing. Um, so, but interesting, you know, and uh, part of the sort of a, a raft of state gun laws that, that have passed, at least, you know, passed through the legislature, parts of the legislatures recently. What We have uh, two more states to, to cover on that front, right? Yeah, so we actually got some... Uh, 
changes out of Iowa, another sort of package of this time gun rights bills, uh, one of them banning the use of MCC codes, the merchant category codes from credit card companies that has sort of become one of the topics du jour in gun policy lately, where uh, you have states like, you know, my home state of Colorado is currently considering it. California has already instituted a mandate that, you know, these credit card companies need to attach these codes to gun retailers. And then you've seen a raft of, of more red leaning states, you, you could safely say, that are actively banning companies from doing so. And then Iowa looks like it's going to be the latest. Um, in addition to that policy, they passed enhanced preemption, sort of another trend in red leaning states where they already had a preemption law that says the states, only the states can pass gun laws. But now it attaches potential civil penalties for localities that are that try to do local gun control and then are sued. And then finally, the, the biggest thing they changed is they're going to allow uh, teachers, public school teachers, the opportunity to get a special permit to allow them to carry on school grounds to act as sort of the first line of defense against potential attackers. Yeah, so it's not just blue states that are passing gun laws right now. We're, you're seeing a lot of action from red states as well, passing exactly these kinds of of laws. The MCC code one is a that's that's a new trend, right? That has uh, taken off recently on both sides. So credit card companies are going to be required to have MCC codes for some states and required to not have them for others. It'll be pretty interesting to track how they manage to do all of that. Um, I imagine it'll be fairly difficult to implement piecemeal MCC system. I don't think they've ever had to do something like that before. But uh, also the MCC codes have never really been politicized this way before. I don't I don't think as far as I'm aware. So. Uh, yeah, uh, but that's exactly the kind of stuff I think you'd expect to see. And you know, now that permitless carry has kind of reached its zenith, you're going to see more of these kinds of uh, proposals. I think make it make it through the the red states. Yeah, and but but then speaking of more traditional gun policies, speaking of my home state of Colorado, uh, this one comes to us from the Colorado Sun. They actually passed that assault weapon ban out of the House, so it's officially cleared one chamber. Uh, I did an analysis piece about this a few weeks back, just sort of playing out, gaming out the odds of this bill. And uh, the fact that it, it cleared the House is is a big step. Um, that was always going to be the more likely chamber for it to advance, to be fair. Um, but it's it's made it out of the House and it picked up a Senate sponsor. So that was one of the big uh, sort of warning signs that this potentially wasn't going to go anywhere is that it didn't have a, a sponsor in both chambers. And it has since picked up one in the Senate. And yeah. it has but been you assigned. thought that was likely before too, right? Yeah, there were some rumblings that maybe some of the more progressive senators would be willing to attach their name to this because, you know, for, for context to the to the listeners, this is a much more controversial policy in the Senate, even though it's also a very democratically controlled chamber as well as the House. You've seen tons of reports of senators not wanting to go on the record on this or maybe not thinking it's the best use of their time when it comes to gun policy. Then they could pass all these other gun bills that are being introduced. Uh, but it's been... Given a, a co-sponsor, it's been assigned to a particular committee that I think is strategic. Uh, everyone thought it was going to be the Senate Judiciary Committee because it came out of the House Judiciary Committee, and that would have been controlled by a moderate Democrat. Well, it was put into a, a totally separate committee uh, at the last minute, and I think it's probably going to clear that committee just based on the the makeup. And so it looks okay. like it will get a, a floor vote in the Senate, and I don't know what that's going to look like if it'll if it'll pass. But it's looking like wow. it might be a closer thing than people perhaps originally thought when it was introduced. Has the governor said anything yet on this? So he, once again, nothing definitive where he's like, I will not sign this or I'm totally against this. But he actually spoke to the Colorado Sun, who is the, the news that we linked in the newsletter, and basically said, I think our time would be better spent enforcing our current gun laws instead of, you know, focusing on which weapons aren't and aren't, aren't allowed and or, or focusing where guns can be carried, and which is also another proposal that's being debated. Uh, so, I mean, clearly he's he's not thrilled that this is potentially going to be at his desk. But I didn't hear there's nothing in that statement that says I will veto this or I will not sign this. So tough to say for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, people should go and read that analysis piece because I think it sets up the, the stage pretty well there uh, and tracks with exactly what's what's now been happening. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, Colorado and Colorado, Colorado wins. <laughs> yeah. Co yeah Colorado and Colorado wins. Both are correct. Uh, they're in for a ride on this one. We'll have to keep, keep a close watch.
I would say it'll come down to the wire because the session ends in a little, almost three weeks, a little less than three weeks now. So it's going to be tight and uh, we'll be keeping tabs on it to let you guys know if there's going to be an 11th state with an assault weapon ban. Mm. Um, but heading into some of our stories this week, uh, we got a new one. Uh, this one's from me, actually, from the National Shooting Sports Foundation just released a, kind of a brand new study this week, uh, trying to put more, I guess you could say, quantifiable data points on how many gun owners are out there that own which kinds of magazines, but specifically magazines capable of holding more than 10 rounds, which is, you know, the large capacity magazines that are that tend to be regulated. And they came up with some pretty staggering numbers. So based on ATF data and some surveys of, re of different gun manufacturers and magazine manufacturers between the years of 1990 and 2021, which is the most recent data they have available. They found that about almost 718 million magazines capable of holding more than 10 rounds are out in the civilian market, which is pretty enormous. It's a lot. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think they, they found what almost a billion magazines generally. Yeah. And then there were like 74% of those were uh, capable of holding more than 10 rounds. Yeah, so that, that, that's right. That's a huge number, obviously. I, I tracks with uh, what I would imagine, what I would have guessed, because, you know, if anyone's if you've gone into a gun store in the last 20 years, everything that's sold there will come with a magazine that holds more than 10 rounds, except for maybe like your 1911 or something something along those lines or you know the carry guns the that initial beginning run of the some subcompact uh single stack nine millimeters those were you would get under 10 rounds with those but even that's kind of fallen out of favor now and you know as even i've discussed on the show a number of times before my carry gun is a x six hour p365 x macro which holds 17 rounds now i mean that basically all of your your modern carry guns are are getting beyond 10 rounds as well so uh, in fact i have to i had to buy like little uh 3d printed conversion things for my 10 round magazine so that i can carry in dc if i want to because dc has uh one of these bands and i i got my dc permit and so the only way i, can, I can't take my 17 round magazines in there so i have to create like this Sort of bastardized 10 round magazine yeah. for my active macro. To Frankenstein carry magazine. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and, you know, I, uh, I think you're going to have a, a member's piece on, on this point we're about to get into here. But, uh, which, by the way, do we have an anniversary sale? It's our third anniversary. Uh, today, April 19th, uh, 2021 was when the reload launched. And so now we are three years into this operation. And I think we've had quite a bit of success. Um, for, for a small independent publication, you know, our, our work has been cited uh, in federal court rulings on the Senate floor. Uh, it's had a significant impact on presidential nominations. Um, you know, we've revealed all kinds of information about uh, the largest gun rights group in the country. We've we've covered uh, stories that no one else has covered. So, I, you know, I, I'm really proud of the work we've done. And the work that, that you've been able to contribute as well, Jake. Um, but so in honor of that, we're doing a 20% off sale for the third anniversary. People should head over and sign up for that today. And if they do, they'll be able to get exclusive access to uh, not only the member's email that's going out on Sunday, where your piece is going to be, but also the piece itself. Because a lot of our analysis pieces are for members only. Uh, the news, we try to keep as much of that free as possible and put the uh, analysis as a member perk. But yeah, you know, this report is obviously not done by NSSF in a vacuum. They didn't just decide that this would be a fun thing to do. This obviously comes down to uh, the legal fights over the hardware bans that we've seen, that, that DC ban I mentioned. There's a number of those around the country, uh, including in Colorado where you are. And um, yeah, the, the legal standard that may be decisive in those fights in the end at least uh is whether or not the, these magazines are in common use as understood by the supreme court in 2008's landmark heller decision and so putting out a report that finds there are 700 million 
magazines and they make up 74% of the magazines that have been produced since 1990. Uh, yeah, I think that is trying to underscore this point that these are in fact commonly out there. But the question is whether this has an impact at least before any of these cases make it to the Supreme Court. And I think that's that's one thing you're going to be examining, but maybe you give us a little bit of preview of what your thoughts are. Yeah. So like you said, this doesn't come in a vacuum uh, and it totally, I think, is aimed at the whole common use fights that have been going on so far. And, you know, gun rights advocates have not that they haven't produced data already to this point about sure. magazines being common. Uh, you know, there's the National Firearms Survey and there's other various surveys out there that have tried to put numbers on how common these are. To, you know, to mixed results in the courts, whether or not they treat those as, as reliable. Um, but the biggest problem is this common use, uh, the way Heller described it for what, how handguns are protected under the Second Amendment is the type of arms that are protected are those that are in common use for lawful purposes. And, you know, then they list some of those lawful purposes, whether it's sport shooting, hunting, self-defense, et cetera. Self -defense, yeah. And the self-defense part is sort of where a lot of these judges that have seen these cases, that have reviewed these cases, have sort of keyed in on. And they've said, okay, well, are they in common use for self-defense? And, you yeah. know, a lot of... And they've used a very high bar for what self-defense means, right? That's right. So it's not enough, or at least it hasn't been enough, that you, a, a gun owner says that this magazine is, is for this gun that I use for self-defense. I keep it on my person when I go out in case of a self-defense situation, or I keep it by my bed stand in case of a home invasion that I need to defend myself. It's These judges have instead said, well, we don't see many you know, actual cases of these guns being fired in self-defense, or even if, even if a magazine capable of holding 10 rounds was fired in a self-defense situation, they say, oh, it's only fired an average of two 2.2 times in these encounters. Therefore, that capacity right. is not being used in self-defense and it's not protected. And so you've seen almost across the board with the exception of California case that uh, Judge Benitez, when he struck down their ban, other than that, at the federal level thus far, it's basically uh, those challenges have died almost entirely on that standard. So until yes. the Supreme Court weighs in definitively, I think you'll probably see that. Uh, I don't know if the study will move the needle much more uh, just because they'll say the same thing. And, oh, that's great. You have more empirical data now, but it's still, we haven't seen that it's being fired 10 plus times in a self-defense encounter. I mean, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Right. Uh, the, there, I, I do think that them being 74% of the total population of magazines since the 90, since 1990 might change some judges mind on this front uh, who think, who has an idea that these are, rarer than they really are. Um, but yeah, I think that's the, you've identified the ultimate problem here with this um, as a legal tactic, at least. I mean, it's still a useful report regardless. Uh, but if, if the idea is to try and use this to overturn magazine bans, uh, you have to look at what the legal theory has been to uphold those bans. And this doesn't really address it because the legal, now, you can obviously critique the legal theory, um, especially because, uh, you know, you look at the National Firearms Survey that, that Professor William English did. We had him on the podcast, by the way, a couple uh, a while back to talk about that, that survey. Um, so people should check out that episode if they haven't. But, uh, you know, his survey, I asked people how, you know, how often they if they've ever been in a self-defense uh, shooting or used a gun in self-defense. And then if they had, he asked them, you know, how many rounds they fire. And uh, it's true that the most common, well, the most common answer was actually zero rounds, which gets to the problem with this, the way that some of these lower courts are interpreting the standard of common use. Um, but all, yeah, the, beyond that, the next common, most common was one shot and then two shots and then so on. So it got rarer and rarer after that. Um, because in real life, you know, gunfights aren't like the movies. You're not standing around just unloading magazine after magazine at one another um, in, in a real world gunfight. Um, so uh, and in a real world defensive gun use, you, you're most likely, at least according to the surveys, not using your gun to shoot people at all uh, or even shoot at people. Right. So, uh, of course, that obviously brings up the, the problem that, that would make all magazines 
not in common use for self-defense because people mostly use their guns uh, to scare off somebody without having to shoot at them, at least according to their own recollection that they've given in surveys. And right. It's a topic we've covered before, the various arguments about how to measure defensive gun use and so on and so forth. Uh, lots of podcasts on that, too, if people want to dive deeper. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the issues that you run into with this logic and one of the problems with trying to um, produce a report like this to counter it. Now, it might have more success the higher up you go or in different circuits or really once you get to the Supreme Court itself. Um, I think that's where perhaps the game starts to change uh, because it's it's hard to see any of these these lower courts um, in the more liberal districts uh, or sorry, the more liberal, more liberal circuits changing tact at this point. It's not impossible, but it's uh, like you said, it's this doesn't actually engage with the legal argument that's being used to uphold the these restrictions to this point so we'll see if uh see if it changes anything in court i say yeah we'll, we'll definitely keep tabs if it moves the needle one way or the other i do want to make just one more point about that sort of test that they're using or that the at least the liberal more liberal circuits have coalesced around to uphold these bans it, it's it is funny that you know they don't take necessarily the existing evidence as gospel about how many magazines there are out there but they are using either survey data or incomplete empirical data on these self-defense mm -hmm. encounters, which I think yeah. is important for listeners to know. They, they cite either like the gun violence archive or the NRA had a, a defensive gun use database at one point. Uh, uh, or which Heritage as well. And Heritage does as well. And all of these rely on just whatever a new, local news yeah. <laughs> publication happens to report on. collection of news stories, basically. <laughs> right. And so it's like, that's also incomplete. And so it just goes to show you sort of the game that's being played here where some potentially incomplete studies are being held up over others and so like you said though we'll, yeah. we'll keep it kept tabs on how that i think at the develops. bottom of the, the bottom line for this though is basically that the these lower courts are not using the standard that the supreme court actually held uh, put down in heller like the the standard wasn't that it that handguns have to actually be used um in shootings and self-defense shootings to be in common use the, the common use standard wasn't, um, it was about what people commonly owned for, you know, for lawful purposes for, you know, what was legally owned at the time, because this goes back to Miller, uh, the, the NFK, NFA case in the thirties that Heller derives a lot of its logic from, and they were taught in, in Miller, it talks about how, um, you know, the, the, uh, early militias were made up of people who were bringing their own firearms. And so the guns that were protected by the Second Amendment and the Miller framing are the ones that people owned commonly, that, that most people owned and would bring to fulfill their militia service. So that's where this whole thing derives from original, originally. And so you know, to say that they had to be guns that were commonly used for uh, self-defense doesn't really fit in that rubric. Um, so, but you know, that, that doesn't mean that it's going to change. This is what you've seen, uh, the lower courts coalesce around probably in large part because Heller focuses so much on self-defense and not on, you know, the militia or, or, um, you know, other lawful uses of firearms, recreational shooting or hunting or, or what have you. Uh, so most of the Supreme Court's discussion is about self-defense and th their point is that, you know, handguns can't be banned because they're the most common gun used for people to protect themselves inside their own home. So, uh, you know, you, you can see where that it's sort of a game of telephone at, at a certain point, um, whether it's, you can obviously, people can judge for themselves how much of a good faith effort. The lower courts are making to enforce the standard in Heller, but but um, regardless of all of that, the the key question I think we're we're focused on your piece is going to be mainly about is whether this is going to work. This the report is going to have an impact on how these cases are playing out, right? I mean, we'll keep tabs on that as it goes forward. Um, and then the final story we want to 
get to today actually comes to you, from you uh, talking about a new legal development with the National Rifle Association, this time in a case not in New York. Uh, if you want to tell hmm. us what happened and, and what's going on. Yeah, this was the case that got a lot less attention than most of the other NRA cases have. This one dealt with uh, the NRA Foundation. So the 501c, one of the 501c3s, the NRA, like a lot of major political groups, is is actually made up of a coalition or a, like a, a network, a spider's web of uh, different legal entities uh, because, you know, there, there's different rules, different laws that govern the way you can use money um, in different sorts of organizations. And so if you want to be able to, uh, you know, be as efficient as possible in using your supporters money, you are likely going to have three or four or five, even I think the NRA has like six or seven legal entities that, you know, really make up the actual entire organization. Um, the biggest one, the most important one that people, talk about or think about is the the 501c4 the national rifle association of america which is the membership organization organization sorry when you buy a nra membership you're buying um a membership in this or you're donating to this 501c4 group and that's the one that uh does a lot of the um uh, stuff that people associate with the nra you know educational programs and uh training and and sport shooting stuff like that um <clears throat> and uh and then you have like the there's political groups the political victory fund that's a pack you know that that's the one where we, when we talk about their fundraising for for political ads or to support donald trump or oppose joe biden or whatever that's the generally speaking is the political victory fund the pack there's also a super pack that is more flexible in how much money it can take in and spend, but there's limitations on how it can spend. You know, there, there's all sorts of rules that go into all this stuff. And at the center of this case deals with the foundation, which is a 501c3, where, you know, you can donate money and it's tax, tax deductible when you do, but your, your name is public as well. It's public record that you've donated to the group. Unlike when you buy an NRA membership that 501c4, they don't have to disclose their donors. Um, so, uh, there are also rules about how money can move between these organizations, right? Uh, as you might expect. And so that's what this lawsuit was over. The, was the core of the claim was that the NRA's foundation was sort of ignoring its own mission and priorities in order to give loans and transfer money to the 501c4 which is where a lot of the corruption allegations sprung from a lot of the um, expenses for that were involved in the New York case the, where the NRA, the 501c4 was found to have not safeguard its charitable assets. And Wayne LaPierre was found liable for millions of dollars in damages due to the way he diverted the organization's money towards his own uh, lavish personal expenses. And so part of this whole thing was that the the accusation was that the foundation was giving money to the NRA, loaning them money on without, you know, doing their due diligence, without having, you know, the proper uh, policies in place to ensure that the money was being spent in the right way, that they were going to be paid back properly. Uh, that was, uh, you know, the, the AG accused them of, of, using the place as a piggy bank. Um, and so they've, they were supposed to go to court. They're supposed to start the trial for that case, uh, I believe by the end of this month. And instead now the two sides have settled this, this case and it's settled through a deal that includes a consent decree, which directs the NRA's foundation to carry out a number of reforms. Um, so they'll have to, for instance, appoint an audit committee uh, to go through and, and audit their uh, their finances each year. They have to uh, create a conflict of interest policy that um, identifies any potential conflicts of interest with people who run the NRA Foundation, who also happen to be a lot of the same people who run the, the rest of the NRA. 
Uh, Tom King is the president, I believe, of the foundation, and he's also an NRA uh, board member uh, and the head of the president of the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, people remember from Bruin. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, there, there's an, a number of things. They also have to put in a bunch of rules about how they uh, donate or loan money to the NRA, like written down policies on that front. And, you know, a lot of things that at least they didn't have before. Now, uh, the NRA itself or, and the foundation are claiming that, you know, they're claiming this is a victory. Both, both sides are claiming victory here, as you is usually is often the case in settlements, I think. And uh, the NRA is saying, well, these are these are relatively minor changes that are in line with how we were already operating. While as, whereas the AG says that uh, you know these are significant concessions that the organization has made, um, and will bring them in compliance with DC nonprofit law, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, basically the NRA has to, the foundation has to implement a bunch of uh, reforms, but they also aren't going to they have to admit any wrongdoing. That's part of the settlement. They don't admit to any wrongdoing. Uh, they also will not have a overseer appointed. That was something the attorney general had wanted uh, initially. They won't have, uh, they won't have their assets placed into a trust or anything like that. There were much more severe penalties that, that could have been imposed if the attorney general got his way through the court or, you know, through the trial, but that's all been averted by the settlement. And, uh, you know, the NRA has, has to, implement. now if the NRA doesn't follow through on some of these reforms, the AG can go back and start the process over again, according to the settlement. But um, it does feel like something where the NRA has gotten this off their plate. You know, um, people can read the settlement. We have it linked in uh, the piece that we wrote up on this, and they can decide for themselves who's telling the truth, I guess, one way or the other on the NRA versus the AG. Uh, certainly, they, AG, the NRA had to agree to certain reforms uh, for this deal to happen. Um, how significant those reforms are, people can, or, you know, how they feel about the NRA not having some of these things to begin with. Yeah, that's That's for people to decide on their own, but... Um, it, at the end of the day, I think in the big picture, it's, it's some, it's one less thing the NRA has to worry about as they head into this second phase of the New York trial, which is a much bigger deal, uh, I think, because the New York trial, uh, is where you could see significant changes forced on the NRA, where their leadership has to leave and reforms are made to the way the organization operates. Those are all things possible in the second phase of this trial. And that's obviously not what current NRA leadership would want to happen. So this lets them uh, get this particular suit out of the way so that they can focus on the second half of this New York trial. Yeah, that to me was the main takeaway is just, yeah, <clears throat> you know, yet another legal battle over governance complaints over the NRA is not good for an organization that's as we've reported, yeah, in decline year over year for the last several years. Um, but to have that off their plate is helpful. Uh, yeah. Whether or not it's the, the big win that they claim, as you, you know, you mentioned in your piece, you quote from uh, various members of the NRA saying, oh, this is just a great victory and confirms the NRA's commitment to good governance. I'm not, I'm not so sure, but yeah, like you said, I think having to be under consent decree is probably not a sign that you were, uh, I, it's not like a big win for either side, I wouldn't think, because right. you know they could have gone to trial and gotten what they really wanted, which is either for the NRA for the case to be totally dismissed, or for the AG to have a coin-appointed overseer run the NRA's foundation. But instead, they've come to this deal, and it's kind of a give and take, seems like to me. Uh, but it's not something where <laughs> that uh, I think it's hard to to read it as like a a, a big. Uh, um, green check mark for the NRA's foundation that they had to settle this case this way, but right. but at the same time it doesn't it doesn't take away control from the leadership and they're they're basically being tasked with reforming themselves, which is kind of what the NRA wants to happen in the New York case as well. So I think they 
they they probably view it as a win in that certainly in that sense yeah 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 but like i said the the, the real action will come this june when uh, things start ramping up more heavily in the in the new york case and i think that will be more of the obvious to your point, more of the deciding yeah. factor for what the organization looks like going forward. Absolutely. That's, that's the much more important bit. But, uh, anyway, what, uh, what do you got going on this weekend? You got, did you end up going shooting with your friend, uh, as you had said the last what, two weeks, I think. Yeah. I was gonna say, unfortunately for the third time listeners, I, my, my weekend update is going to be trying to go shooting because it <laughs> fell through last weekend. So the first weekend it was sort of act of God, crazy weather. But, mm. uh, last weekend, my friend had to go out of town unexpectedly. So wasn't able to go shooting this weekend. I'm hoping, you know, hopefully the weather yeah, cooperates and all that, but, uh, Hopefully this weekend and then next weekend I can tell you or next week's podcast I can talk to everyone about how that went taking someone to shoot their first gun, which is always fun. I always enjoy doing that. But yeah. So we'll see. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I get where you're I get where you're at. I mean, it's you're busy just like me. And I should go and zero my my optic for my carry gun. I haven't really been carrying it that much because I'm not a hundred percent sure about my my zero at this moment, I did zero it. Uh, it took a little bit of time to try and zero it a bit at the uh, journalist range day, uh, did a couple of weeks ago, but I didn't, you know, it was a pretty chaotic thing when you're, you're overseeing, you know, new shooters. I don't sure. have a lot of time to try and get my zero down. And plus the dot that I got this, the Sealy, they're like, oh, you should zero this at 25 yards. And so <laughs> I haven't done that for sure yet and so um maybe i i need to get to the range and and try that uh maybe tomorrow maybe we'll see we'll see <laughs> but um yeah i think i think that's it for this week right uh so yeah head over to check out our 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 anniversary sale it's we really don't do sales very often i you know part of my philosophy here and we're not trying to do a Joseph A. Bank thing where everything's always on sale. So the <laughs> sale is uh, we do it maybe once, twice a year. So if you're if you're interested in the reloads work, if you want to support what we do and also get access to exclusive analysis pieces you won't find anywhere else, uh, and get that extra weekend newsletter as well as early access to this podcast and the opportunity, to, well, to the interview podcast. Which, by the way, this week we are going to be talking about the dramatic decline in murders and the lack of mass shootings so far this year. Um, you know, it's, it's April um, 19th today, and we haven't actually had a, a mass shooting yet, but it's not clear that that means we will have fewer of them this year. And we'll get into that on the podcast with crime data analyst, Jeff Asher, which I'll be filming later today. And we'll be out for members on Sunday and for everyone else on Monday. But you also get the opportunity to appear on the show in a member segment. So head over and check out our membership options today. And uh, if you're not ready to do that yet, sign up for our free newsletter. You see what we're all about. All right. That's all we've got for this week. All right, Jake, we will uh, we'll see, see you, again. you guys again next week. Next week. No, the devil's got no.